Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. The Pizzagate conspiracy theory emerged in 2016, claiming that Hillary Clinton was involved with child sex trafficking being run out of a Washington, D.C. pizzeria called Comet Ping Pong. The theory alleged the involvement of high-profile individuals connected to a pedophile ring of underage children. Wait, it did not have anything to do with pizza. I think it involved private jet flights to a Caribbean island implicating not Hillary, but Bill Clinton and many other powerful and influential individuals all having sex with underage girls. Something to do with Jeffrey Epstein. I'm, I'm confused. What is a conspiracy and what is real? Let's discuss today. Well, okay. warm greetings. Hi, Sarah. Hi. St. Louis, uh, our own old stomping grounds. And um, we're, look, we're looking forward to you being on our podcast. Uh, Thank you. So um, anyway, let me give you a little, give our guests some background ab about you, Sarah. You are a prolific author. Uh, I've read all three of your books. And because I'm from the general area, I think I must have purchased uh, six <laughs> copies of this one oh, uh... <laughs> to, to give to all my friends in St. Louis. I have friends in St. Louis and Belleville and so forth. Uh, Thank that you. was a view from flyover country. And that was your first book. And what was so good about that book is you kind of predicted you were one of the few people that said, wait a second, Trump is may in fact uh, be a little more of a threat than people realize. And you were absolutely right. And you were an outlier when you did that book. Your, your second book was Hiding in Plain Sight, and that just continued with the Trump theme. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure you're sick of Trump after going through both those. I think we all are, but yes. <laughs> I think I think with that. And this is the book that we're so excited about now. It's They Knew... How the culture of conspiracy keeps America complacent, and it's uh it's not an easy book just to be at a cocktail party and say I read this great book and here's the book. It it takes a little bit of work to, to discuss what some of the concepts are uh, with your book. But you are you're um I'll I'll post in the uh, in the show notes uh, what a remarkable uh, writer you are and uh, best selling author and. Um, some Thank you. In interesting backgrounds with uh, uh, in, the, in the study of anthropology. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Good, good. Tell me a little bit about what prompted they knew, other than the fact that you were stuck in a pandemic uh, cage for a long time and you were, uh, tell me about the book. Well, they knew talks about actual real life conspiracies and also the phrase conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist and how a lot of times it's used as a pejorative way to dismiss um, a person who's investigating conspiracies and uh, prematurely stop discussions of corruption um, and things that our government or other forces, corporate forces, don't want us to know. Um, and I saw quite a bit of this as I was, among other things, going into Trump's background um, and the background of those around him, people like Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, et cetera, Jared Kushner, and these very intricate uh, global networks um, of corruption and criminality that our own government was content uh, to do nothing about or even encouraged for decades on end. And often people responded to me with extreme skepticism. And their skepticism was rooted in this idea that our institutions were fine, that if something were actually awry, they would certainly jump into action and fix it right away, that our media would report on it. They didn't understand it. And so I would get smeared uh, you know, with this name of conspiracy theorist. But then I started thinking about that. Like, what is a conspiracy theorist? And I was like, well, someone who has a theory about a conspiracy. And if a conspiracy by its very nature obfuscates and hides the truth, but you know, reveals through its actions what, what some of the um, you know, shady evidence is, and people attempt to put it together, well then yes, of course they have a theory about conspiracies. Um, and of course it's a normal thing to do. Honestly, it's an act of civic inquiry. And of course it can also be weaponized as we see through bad actors like Alex Jones and other uh, propagandists who like to hide behind that conspiracy theory veneer. 
Yeah, so it's a way of just dismissing people, like just like you say, oh, he's yes. a right wing nut, and then the, the, the conversation stops right there. And yeah. what I what I I I do a short introduction to uh, my podcast, and I did a compare and contrast between PizzaGate and Epstein. Yes. Well, I, you know, PizzaGate, they're you know having children in the basement, and they're pedophiles, and they're organizing this with really high profile people. And well, wait a second. Epstein had people fly flying on an airplane to an island uh, with pedophilic young young women, underaged women, and uh, and you you know it it's you just can't stop the discussion by saying oh if you believe that you're you're a conspiracy nut so I don't know no that's one of the examples that I discussed and they knew because um, Trump's team in particular Michael Flynn when Epstein began to become somewhat of a point of mainstream discussion that's when the Pizzagate myth arrived because if they publicized that you know which was a ridiculous myth you know it was about a, com a place called Comet Ping Pong in DC and you know it had a basement full of kidnapped children it does not have a basement there were no kidnapped children being brought there um, to be clear Epstein and Maxwell's operation was very real and did implicate, uh, you know, global heads of power in, in what appears to be a very sophisticated and sadistic uh, blackmail and espionage operation. But then, of course, when people finally did hear the details of that, a lot of them were dismissive. They thought, well, that sounds like that Pizzagate thing. That sounds like the kind of crazy tinfoil hat stuff that, you know, Alex Jones or Michael Flynn or other people talk about. And that benefited tremendously uh the you know people involved in epstein and maxwell's operation and the people who failed uh, to investigate it or invite them right and then you have bill barr's involved and, and maxwell's bill barr's dad <laughs> and bill barr's dad and then maxwell is convicted. And maxwell's dad and yeah and we and, and her involvement and you, as you start to go through all this and you're reporting, I'm thinking you are either a nut or the best reporter I've ever seen in my life. Because, you, you know, it, who are the people that Maxwell apparently is, you know, were accused of having these relationships with that's covered up. And, uh, you know, the, the, his, his death having a lot of uh, difficulties um, uh, with some of the facts surrounding it. So I, you know, I, I think the, the, Foundation of your work, though, comes from you have a PhD in anthropology, and when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was this what swept into that void were all of these corrupt oligarchs that came through and carved up the country, and it was very much of a kind of a mob boss kind of arrangement. And you studied that, and if I could put words in your mouth, you you are saying you know wait a second this is going to th this is a bigger deal than people think this is going to show up in other countries this is going to show up in hungary it's going to show up in italy it's going to show up in the united states i i'm not so sure you're not right about i mean i'm sure you're i think you're kind of I right think about we've, that we've seen it i mean and I, honestly i think this is one of the things that people have trouble understanding about trump and russia because a lot of the you know the news coverage has either made him look like a spy or they focus on what i think are very small details like bot farms or troll farms online this is about the money you need to follow the money and the majority of people you know when they say russian influence it's transnational mafia influence and a lot of those oligarchs and mafiosos originate from the former soviet union not just from russia but from you know georgia or uzbekistan or all these other countries that were once part of it and then they move around these are guys who have like five passports they're not loyal or interested in any particular country they're often backed by the kremlin because they, they you know support the kremlin financially and then the kremlin supports them materially you know it's a very parasitic relationship but in the U.S., people were equally involved. People like Paul Manafort, people like Bob Dole, you know, who ran for president and then registered as a, um, you know, an agent for Russia. People like Michael Flynn, you know, who worked as an agent for Russia. And, you know, it, it spans the party lines. It's not just limited to the Republicans and Trump. And that's one of the reasons they don't like reporting on it. You know, the FBI, two former heads of the FBI went on to work for the head of the Russian mafia after leaving the FBI. What kind of knowledge, what kind of, you know, classified information did they bring to those endeavors and why did they choose that? Like, those are questions that people get very uncomfortable about because they just annihilate this idea that it's a, you know, a two-party 
bipartisan feud that we're just enduring and not something much more sick and corrupt and rooted in greed. Uh, they don't want to deal with the implications of that at all. I want to bring Greg into this. The very first podcast we did was How Democracies Die, and I just loved the book, and I was surprised when Greg condemned it. And he said, you know, you don't you don't realize we, we don't really have a democracy. Our institutions aren't uh, in the process of failing, that they have failed consistently. Um, so I I don't know, Greg. I'm I, based on that kind of me interpreting your your thoughts there. Do you? What are your thoughts about the book and the difference between the a conspiracy, a conspiracy theory, and a dysfunction and the dysfunctional institutions that we seem to be observing before us? I I, I love Sarah's uh, nasty words. I, I get excited when I hear talking about all these these people and how corrupt they are because they are. And I think that's what they deserve. So, but yeah, it, it's uh, the media has been cons complicit really for a long time in hiding this. It's been part of America since the beginning. There's always been corruption. When you have elites, when you have privilege, when you have wealth, you're going to have a, a whole world that we don't know about. It's you go back to the movie Chinatown. Now, there's a scene in Chinatown where the uh, the old man played by uh, John Huston says, "You don't understand how things work." And it's kind of a metaphor for America. Uh, you have that again in the uh, Kramer movie with uh, uh, Eyes Wide Shut, where these young upper middle class people walk into a situation and they're they're very, you know, they're, they're knowing people, they've been around, they travel. They didn't know what they were getting into. So America's always had this, but our complicit media's kind of kept it down. I think it really broke. And I don't know the etymology of conspiracy theory. I'm sure that Sarah does, but... I think it really broke with the Kennedy assassination, its aftermath, when conspiracy theory became weaponized by our security apparatus. They didn't want people digging into this. Whatever your thinking is about the assassination, they didn't want people digging into this. So anything that was counter to you know, the establishment view, they called a conspiracy theory, and that became popular. And, and I, I like the way Sarah has now shown where that's being weaponized by other forces. You know, to but but that's essentially what happens. You, you you once it's let loose, it's unleashed, and you have a time in America where the institutions are deteriorating, where they're becoming more and more corrupted, and they're going further further down in a hole. But people are aware of this, and so of course they're going to be looking for conspiracy theories or theories that explain why this two party system is not working for them, why the Supreme Court is not working for them, all the other institutions. I can go on and on. I won't. I'd like to ask Sarah to say more about it, but I'd just like to say, I remember a, a moment, I was at a dinner in, in San Francisco with, uh, uh, I was in a wine business before I retired, and I'm sitting next to a guy, I had nothing to talk about, and we said something about Kennedy, and he says, the, oh, the Kennedy assassination, you know, uh, there's more to that than you think, and I thought, well, here's a kindred spirit, somebody that can discuss rationally what's going on, so I started telling him some some questions I had, he says, do you know there's a tunnel from San Francisco all the way under the United States. It comes out in Washington, D.C. And you realize how once you open this door, the crackpots really can come in and exploit that. And I think that's what your book uh, helps us understand more clearly. I mean, I agree with all of that, especially um, the Kennedy aspect. I mean, I think some of this is, you know, mass media and television took off and solidified in the 1950s. And then you get the assassination of JFK. And then after that, you get the assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald by the television. So this is sort of the first mass media uh, tragedy that people are witnessing live. And then they get a report about it after that doesn't really seem to jibe with a lot of the facts. It doesn't seem to represent a lot of the other reporting that's been out there. And then you get a series of assassinations through the 1960s, you know, of RFK, of Martin Luther King, of Malcolm X, of all these individuals, um, you know, many of whom were pushing for the same policies, you know, against the Vietnam War for civil rights, et cetera. And I feel like, like every generation has this sort of central conspiracy that affected their own generation in a very personal way and that is unresolved and i think for the boomers it's the assassination of the kennedys um and, and martin luther king as well i think for my generation it's 9 11. you know i think we very rightfully have questions about 9 11 about the fact that you know 
Bush administration was warned about it many times and did nothing yeah. about the wars uh, in the aftermath that my generation went and fought for, for really no good reason. And, you know, I look at my kids' generation and I wonder if COVID and the way COVID has been handled and weaponized and, you know, propagandized, whether that's going to be, you know, the tragedy of their time. You know, and I want to emphasize like, these are all tragic, horrible events because great trauma you know even if you don't have any personal connection like to the kennedy family just watching that like one of my you know, i write about this in the book how my mom was uh, my parents were 13 when jfk was assassinated and they get an announcement you know over the intercom in the school system that you know the president is dead the president who they loved and it's something they remember forever that moment of, of a beginning and an end of a world before and a world after and then you spend a long time trying to figure out how we got to this point and what the world would have been like if that that event hadn't happened. And that's how I felt, um, you know, with 9-11 as well. And what happens when you start digging into that is, you you know, and this is the part that gets disturbing, is you, you realize these bad forces were there the whole time, except that they were covered up very well. That's why they're able to leap into action in the aftermath of a tragedy and either cover it up or in the case of, say, the Bush administration, exploit it immediately, you know, for their own uh, malevolent geopolitical ends and then you start questioning well if that was happening all the time like why wasn't anyone on top of it like where are our agencies of accountability where are our reporters and then you start hearing from reporters that say hey actually i did try you know reporting about that and i was censored or i was threatened or this then that happened to me and then as you said you, know, you get to the point where you're like yeah this isn't a democracy you know this is a country that i think most of us want it to be a democracy there are people fighting for it to, to be a democracy and there always have been and i think there always will be but then there are forces uh that are more powerful um that are trying to stomp that out you know we're, we've never fully been one and, and we still are not there yet and you know in the kennedy assistance what was it just a month ago the uh CIA fellow that or one of the security people talked about the bullet and how the bullet was moved and and how it's just, you know, it was never really dealt with. And if he's correct, then there was just absolutely impossible to have one shooter. Well, and then yeah, we there's few- people coming forward after like 50 years. I think right. God, right. I know that it's like I'm, I know there is a connection to Israel in some way, like it was an Israeli, like a bodyguard or an investigator or something like that. I don't know. Um, Jefferson Morley had it, but it made the mainstream news as well. Um, and yeah, like but just the fact that things are withheld for so long that every president in my lifetime has said, yes, I will release those documents. And then they don't. Um, and then it builds and builds and builds. Like, of course, people come up with theories. And of course, some of those theories become crazy. You know, they become absurd, like the one of, you know, a large underground tunnel from San Francisco to D.C. or, you know, or, or worse things. Um, and then, of course, they're also exploited, I think. The, the campaign of RFK Jr. is an example of that kind of exploitation of, of trauma and exploitation of obfuscation. You're a good writer, uh, but I can tell as a kid, you've probably read every Sting- Stephen King book that's ever been written. Am I, am I, <laughs> oh, absolutely. It, because this reads like a horror movie. You know, it's just like no one's listening. They, he's inside the house. It's 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 falling apart. Please, please. <laughs> it has yeah. a little... A little sprinkle of Hunter S. Thompson in there too, but you know, not 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 the not the alcoholism and the depression, but just just the I kind ended of this... up reading him again, Hunter S. Thompson. It was this weird thing. I was in I actually mentioned the bookstore in They Knew. I was in this used bookstore, and you know, I said to my kids, "I'm gonna close my eyes and walk down a hall, and you know, it's a huge store. Point to a book, and whatever that is, that's my future." So I grab a book, I open up a page, and it's a collection of Hunter S. Thompson, just essays from the 1980s that he was writing um, in San Francisco about the Reagan administration. And of course, the page I'm on is about Donald Trump and uh, uh, Adnan Khashoggi. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> what are the odds? But I ended up buying that book and rereading it, and it kind of knocked me out of a, a depressive stupor that I'd, I'd fallen in a bit because of the pandemic, just like the rest of us. And yeah, you are absolutely all right about Stephen King being a big influence, you know, Shirley Jackson, Ray Bradbury, Peter Straub, all those horror writers. And I needed some kind of framework, honestly, to relay the sheer horror of the information that I knew because I felt like delivering it in a just completely straight way without any style or just, I don't know, any attempt at at beauty and prose or whatever, something to kind of make it go down a little easier. I'm not sure it made it go down easier. It made it go down more interesting. I don't know for better or for worse, but yeah, it's a lot to take in. It was a hard, grueling book to write, but I felt like the information needed to be out there because I think these are things that Americans should know to be able to more fully understand what's happening now. 
Sarah, yeah. Sarah, let me ask you a question uh, that I can't answer. Uh, I, some ideas, but I can't really answer it. You know, when all these conspiracies that were not conspiracies, these these truths, the assassination, um, Iran Gate, um, uh, even the seventy seven ex, the, the explanation of the CIA's involvement. These things started coming out, but they quickly died down in a bipartisan way. In Nixon's Watergate, for example, I, when I was a kid, I'm in my 20s when it happens, and I'm thinking America will never be the same again. Well, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And within the end of the by the end of the decade, they were celebrating Nixon and his library. All the people were going to it. That worked well up until let's call it the modern era, the 21st century. And now the divisions, even within a confinement like the two party system. They're at each other's throats. I mean, they're exposing each other, lying about each other. You're making stuff up about each other. That's how angry everybody is. What changed? I mean, what really precipitated the rules changing? So the media can't contain it anymore. They can't make it go away. They can't put a Band-Aid on it. I mean, I think the internet changed it. And I think there's this mm -hmm. brief period kind of from the late 90s up until about, I don't know, 2011, 2012, before social media, when people were blogging, and there was a sort of obligation to show your work, to put in links to your evidence, and you would be called out, you know, if you didn't do that. The standards were higher. Like, everything looks like it's written by some incredible genius compared to the standards of, of right now with these little, you know, TikTok videos and whatnot. Um, and so I think at that time, the those who wanted to keep this information suppressed were having a very difficult time doing so because everything was suddenly online. It was available. At that point, a lot of the media was free. Now it's mostly paywalled. And I think a lot of people made a good faith effort uh, to get to the bottom of a lot of events. But then what happened, and this is the depressing part, is that even when crimes could be solved or exposed, uh, there were no consequences for those who committed them. You know, we saw this with Bush in Iraq. We saw this with Wall Street and the financial collapse. In 2008, we certainly saw it with, you know, the endless crimes that Trump and, and his lackeys committed while in office that they freely confessed to. We don't have anybody holding them to account now. We don't have the DOJ who does it. There's a whole class of people who live above the law in every way possible. And then another class of people in media who do not want to admit that because if they admit it in a serious way, um, then they can lose their own job. And a lot of these jobs, by the way, during this time, became incredibly elite. You know, media uh, is a profession that tends to not pay very well, but the bar to entry became higher and higher. <laughs> you needed um, unpaid internships. You suddenly needed a master's degree when before you didn't even need a BA. You just needed to be able to, to write well and research well and interview well. And that's to keep people out. It's to keep out muckrakers and critical thinkers and people that are not in geographic big city hubs on the coast that are very expensive to live in, you know, just to be able to survive there, you need like parental support or some other kind of inherited wealth. Most people don't have that. And so it's not a democratic media. It's not a democratic government. And that means a lot of things are being suppressed and that you know, a lot of people aren't being punished. And even though I think there's immense dissatisfaction with this, and you see it in a lot of ways, you know, right now, I think, there's a record number of independent voters. Like there are fewer people registered in a political party than any point in our history because everyone's just fed up. But there doesn't seem to be mechanisms in place for repercussions for people who have committed crimes against the American public and against law and against uh, you know the good of the country. There just isn't any way to stop them. And that's the scary part. Yeah, as and a, our as an unreconstructed, oh. as an unreconstructed old guard Marxist. Me, I'm going to put you on a spot. Do you believe that we have a ruling class in this country? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I, I think it's based on inherited wealth networks and either a willingness to be silent and complicit that's based out of self interest or bribery, uh, blackmail threats, and the kind of tactics that the mafia uses. I think that we have become more of a mafia state. Um, in the vein of kleptocracies in the former Soviet Union. You know, that was one of the reasons I recognized the threat of Trump earlier is I was like, well, this sounds like Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or Russia or Azerbaijan. It's not like this style of rule, but it's always been there. It just got worse and worse and more corrupt, in part because there hasn't been uh, accountability, you know, for decades on end. A lot of the people committing crimes 
when I was in elementary school are the same people being put back into administrations over and over again. People like Bill Barr or Elliot Abrams from Iran-Contra or Roger Stone or Paul Manafort. They've been priming since before I was born and absolutely nothing happened to them. And that's because there is, you know, a class in place uh, to protect them and to protect their own dirty money in the process. If one of them goes down, then I think the standard of expectation of the public shifts and people start demanding more. They demand more for themselves and they demand more of, um, you know, accountability and justice for people who've exploited uh, and hurt our country. And they don't want us to have those demands. They want us to just shrug and either say, oh, that's just the way it is, or they want us to somehow supplicate ourselves um, and join in this horrific endeavor, which, you know, I have uh, decided not to do. You know, I, I think you, I'm a big Matt Taibbi fan. I don't know if, I don't know if you are Greg or, or Sarah, but I, I, I disagree with him, but I think generally speaking, he's an old school journalist trying to get the story out. And he did the Twitter, Twitter files. And he, he, uh, he, he it's a pretty big story if he's correct, that the government and powerful other interests were effectively manipulating our, our media system for, for their own for their own benefits even uh, moderna it, it, you know shadow banning things on twitter that was was interfering with their profit and so forth and i it's that's a good story he, he went to congress and who were the people that beat up on him the most the the, the democrats you know they this the system is is broken if if you can't even have reasonable discussions, some of the things he admitted he was wrong, he corrects things. He, like any good journalist, he doesn't get it right all the time. But the um, the amount of hostility towards him, which was a a pretty big story, you know, that our, our social media is being manipulated, controlled, and and um, in in a way that's not beneficial to us. And um, I don't know. What are your thoughts about Matt and that whole? Twitter gate uh, response um, to our government's response to that. I mean, I'm, I'm torn about him. I definitely like his earlier work. You know, I think as most people do um, the work that basically was a stepping stone to occupy wall street and that called mm -hmm. out, um, you know, wall street and Bush and, you know, all of these sturdy financial classes. What I don't like is his association with Elon Musk, uh, you know, who is an oligarch who is tyrannical. And so I, I suspect at the very least, there's obviously malicious motive with Musk backing Taibi and giving him all this money uh, to carry this out. I don't think that Musk is interested in the public good as from that Taibi, I've noticed as time goes on, you know, when you do this kind of work, when you're constantly investigating corruption, you get extremely frustrated when there's no tangible result or few tangible results to everything you've uncovered. Like I know that feeling very well, and I've seen him express that feeling, and I absolutely sympathize with that feeling. But I think sometimes journalists, after that happens, you know, they they look for somebody to just support them and recognize them. They kind of fall prey to that. And I think that's what happened with Musk. Um, as for the Twitter files themselves, I think it's a good idea to look into this. I think the topic is absolutely legitimate of whether the government is manipulating and censoring social media. And honestly, you know, there were things I was hoping he would uncover because there are groups online on Twitter, you know, that appear to be funded by the DOJ and the uh, Biden administration and are brought to the government, um, you know, to get talking points. They take pictures of it. They're, they're not very shy about it. And then they go back out in the world and try to present it as if this is some sort of idea that just stemmed organically from their minds. When there's evidence that they're receiving talking points. I've hardly ever read any kind of expose um, or article about that. So I was hoping, well, maybe P of all people will get to that. I was surprised he didn't. That's so what he did get into. I mean, I felt like it was biased. I felt like um, selective, I guess. And I don't know how much of that is on him or on Musk and the people who are providing him the you know internal communications that he reported on. I think they definitely had an agenda. They used him as a vector of that agenda, and then he became frustrated because, of course, Musk then started um, shadow banning links to Substack, which is you know right. how he makes right. it a thing. So I think in the end, you know, he got kind of screwed over. I do think Congress's uh, reaction. It's extreme, um, and I wish that Congress would focus on something of, of more substance uh, than that. I, I thought he's a product of gotcha, gotcha journalism, and that was his failing. And, you know, he walked into those congressional hearings. I think he was confident that he could handle them. He's the smartest guy around. He was playing with the big boys. I mean, they're dirty and nasty and mean and researches, and they have assistants. And 
I kind of took him aback because uh, the uh, a gotcha journal journalism has that problem. It, it's the people looking, they're sifting through for that big, big disclosure. It's not always a big disclosure. It's something that people work hard to put together, a sort, sort, of, sort, sort out, and then then collect. And I don't, I'm not sure he's cut out for that kind of uh, journalism. But uh, I, I, I like him. I, 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 I read him. I mean, it's worth reading. Uh, Seymour Hersh, on the other hand remains one of my idols and I'm I that's the only the only substack that I subscribe to because he has the history and he does the work and he has the connections I think he's a good source yeah. would you agree I mean you know, he's another one who generally speaking like something like 80 percent of what he wrote I think was brave and admirable and well researched and thorough and I think he's another example of somebody who I think reached their limit with the amount of corruption that they uncovered and published and proved and then no change within the government other than it becoming worse. And I do worry about people who then, you know, one of the places where they are guaranteed to get support is the Kremlin. And the Kremlin is not some sort of like communist paragraph, paradise. It's like a hyper capitalist, brutal, sadistic regime that in many ways is similar uh, to the United States. So it's really like, why in the world would you take your work there or, or appear on a channel like RT? And the reason I, I really dislike it with someone like Seymour Hirsch does that is because I do think his work is good. And I do think it should get a broad audience and people immediately just see like, you know, oh, he went on RT or he did that. And then they dismiss the whole of his body work going all the way back to the 1970s, even though that work has, has borne out very well um, over time, uh, you know, and so it's, it's a frustrating thing to witness. Yeah, well, I, he was driven out of the New Yorker. He was driven out of the United yes. States, essentially. Then he was uh, published in a London Review of Books, and uh, that's the last place that he landed in. He just couldn't get a, get a position here. Yeah. And he, he's got to protect his sources. I agree with you. There's a limit to where he'll go, because if he goes further, his sources are going to disappear. But up to that point, he gives you all you can possibly get. Here's a, here's a question that takes us a little off. Berlusconi, uh, I missed on Trump. I, I woke up that morning and I was shocked when my wife is deceased now, but she says, Trump, I thought she was pulling my leg. Trump won. So you were you were great on that. But once he was in, I saw him as a perfect parallel to Berlusconi. I'm the same kind of an elite who promoted himself in the media, became a media figure, was a hollow man, a hollow person, but was perfect for the time because Italian politics were so screwed up. There was no left party really of any consequence. The old Communist Party became a Democratic Party, which made him a nothing party, and so on. And you get that. And I, do you see the evolution of Trump as a similar phenomenon? That you get the problems, the issues with our two-party system and its failures, producing a character like him and making him viable among millions of people because they're so desperate for some kind of a uh, of, of an answer. Well well, like you said, they blow it up. Ban like Bannon is a Leninist. What do you mean by that? Well, I just want to blow things up. <laughs> That's you said that in your book. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I think the Berlusconi um, comparison is apt as a the comparisons to other strongman figures. You know, Viktor Orban. You know, all of Netanyahu. Um, all of these individuals who have a, a similar kind of um, brutal politics of spectacle. Um, where Trump differs a little is that I think this was a this is a long-term operation. You know, Trump ran or nearly ran for president uh, five times and they kept trying to present him as this kind of neophyte, you know, this outsider. But that just wasn't the case. The first time he seriously contemplated and got funding for a run was 1988 and then he did it again in 96. He actually ran in 2000. He ran in 2012. And so by the time we get to 2016, you know, this is a guy who's very hooked up um, into, you know, political networks and in the Republican Party. Um, and it also gotten this massive image makeover uh, with The Apprentice. Like when I was a child, everyone knew that Donald Trump was synonymous with financial corruption, bankruptcy, failure. Like, you know, it would be on Sesame Street. It would be on this kids show I watched called Erie, Indiana. Like, you know, there are constant jokes that I, as like a seven-year-old, was expected to understand. So it was mind-blowing to me in 2016 when all of these, you know, adults who were adults back then when I was a child suddenly were like, Donald Trump, you know, financial hijinks, who could have imagined that? I'm like, what the hell, man? Did I like hallucinate my childhood? I kept having to go back and read like Dean Barrett and David K. Johnston and all these people who covered it in real time. Spy Magazine, which my mother had a subscription to, you know, which is how I ended up on the course that I'm on here. Um, and I was like, okay, I didn't hallucinate it. It's all right there, clearly laid out. 
And so I think it did take, though, the uh, collapse or erosion in some cases of our institutions for Trump to get in. I also think it took a lot of dirty, dark money and mafia influence for him to get in. But, you know, if he had had a functional political system that had not left so many people disillusioned, distrustful, betrayed, broke, beaten down. And yeah, I don't think that his scam, which he attempted multiple times during multiple attempts to run for president, would have worked. I think it would have failed and he would have lost, you know, and nothing could have stopped that. But we are in a dark place in 2016. People remember it rightly now because, you know, there wasn't a pandemic, there wasn't, you know, multiple threats of World War III, et cetera. Uh, it, it was very dark. And especially where I live in Missouri, you know, people were without opportunity, without hope. They were desperate. Uh, that doesn't, I think, in my mind, justify voting for an open bigot with, you know, 40 years of uh, criminal ties and, and operations. But a lot of people didn't know about that. They thought it was the guy from The Apprentice. And that if he wasn't just the guy from The Apprentice, surely the media or Obama or the FBI or the CIA or someone else would let us know. And they did not. They kept saying, oh, don't worry about it. He's not going to win. Of course he was going to win. Like, And I think they knew that. I think a lot of this has just been uh, streamlined to allow a bunch of criminal behavior and the largest transfer of wealth upward, a trillion dollar transfer upward in the history of our nation, among other uh, horrific acts that have occurred. What, what I like so much about your view from view from flyover country is that you you this isn't just tr this isn't a Trump problem. Trump is not Trump is just a symptom of our country having this div division of our institutions not working well, of people not getting good information. Uh, and then he's he's he steps in and he's he, you know he's he's central casting. Um, you're uh, we Greg and I both have a lot of friends in the Midwest, and I really loved your chapter about uh, America is purple like a bruise. You're, that we we have this tendency just to so simply divide our country into MSNBC and Fox News, and there's no dialogue, and it that's not the way my friends are in Midwest. I have conservative friends, liberal friends. They're all very interested. They're 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 intelligent, uh, but the situation for a lot of them in the Midwest with the way jobs are and the economy, it's it's very very problematic. It's it's a big problem. I don't know. What what are your what are you, yeah, that, it's, I'm, I'm, that's the gist problem. of your book. Yeah, and and you know, one of the things people don't understand or folks on the big cities and the coast I guess don't understand about the Midwest is, you know, a lot of us are here because we didn't have money to begin with. And so the Midwest the Midwest is generally speaking a place where it's I guess, easier to go broke. You go broke more slowly because until very recently, you know, rent and other things um, did not cost quite so much. And so this whole sort of weird attitude, what we ended up with was a situation where certain jobs that have immense influence, like in policy, media, entertainment, et cetera, all became conglomerated in just a few cities uh, on the coast and then maybe uh, Chicago and Atlanta and, and to some extent Dallas, other than that. If you lived anywhere else, you're kind of locked out of the professions of influence. And so a whole separate culture started shaping our political sphere and people had a very keen sense that they were being left out of it, purposely eliminated from it, not even important to the narrative. Whatever uh, the Midwest began to be discussed, and this picked up after Trump uh, became president, it was by these parachute journalists who would come in uh, to places like Missouri, they'd spend like one afternoon in a diner and then they, you know, go and find three Trump fans, not interview anybody else with any kind of, you know, nuanced position or different take, and then come back and say, hey, you know, whatever it is they thought that person would say, you know, they had all these caricatures. I sometimes think those journalists, especially from the New York Times, it's like a stand-in for what they want, because a lot of these, you know, New York people wanted Trump. You know, they wanted a guy who's going to cut their taxes. They wanted a guy who was like a, you know, quintessential scumbag New Yorker in a lot of ways, very familiar entity to them. But they wanted to say that some yokel in a diner in the Midwest was responsible for all these disasters and that it was not rich people in big cities who were responsible for our disasters when the latter, in fact, uh, is what's true. In yeah. our previous <laughs> podcast, we were talking about Danville, Danville, Illinois, which is where Greg grew up. I grew up 15 minutes away from there uh, it's it's got some of the highest crime rates in the country it, uh, it, uh, my sister's my sister's staying with me uh 
she'll be 90 in two days. Uh, she lives in Westville, which is south of Danville. And she stays with me for three, four or five months a year uh, because of her age. And she was shocked when I told her that in the current figures, Danville is the seventh highest crime rate of any city of a comparable size. Now, bear in mind, Danville, when I was a kid, on my street, East 14th Street, Georgetown, Illinois, I could go from one end to the other. The old guy, the old coot in the corner was a retired miner, injured in the coal mines. Next to him was a General Motors employee. Next day, that family was another General Motors employee, all the way down the street and up the other side. My family were coal miners. And uh, then there was a guy in furniture hospital. It was a it was a, a, a working class, affluent working class area, General Motors, right in the middle of the cornfields. Today, it's tattoo parlors. It's those, you know, Illinois has the, the, the uh, slot machines, slot machines yeah. on every corner. Uh, they have a prison now, big prison. That's a big thing. And a casino opened up. So that's a big thing. Suicides are up. Deaths are up. It's a disaster. The, the, the street in Georgetown where I grew up, the corner, the main street corner now is just empty buildings. Occasional restaurant comes and goes. And, and, and you have to see that when I talk to people, I live in Pittsburgh. When I talk to people, I have no clue. They have no idea. And this is not really the East Coast. This is really a semi-Midwestern area itself, an industrial area. But you're right. I mean, it's it's just unfathomable to people in the East. They don't have any clue to what life is like right. in the Midwest. Just It's a strange thing. And I think it was especially profound during the 2010s i feel like now so many places are experiencing that right. level of poverty you're seeing it in the big cities you know that were these affluent hubs as well but it was a hard thing to explain to people like i remember living in st louis and going to like dc or new york and just trying to describe what things were like and i felt like katniss in the hunger games like going from district 12 to the capital and, and people just responded in disbelief you know they said oh everything is fine the economy is great haven't you seen these statistics and i'm just like literally no one i know as a job with benefits. And I'm talking about friends who have a GED all the way through friends who have a PhD. Like none of us can find stable work. Everyone's doing big jobs. Everyone's trying to supplant their income or they have a job that, you know, gives you 29 hours a week so they can cut you out of giving you insurance. So all your money just goes to, to paying for that. Like no one I knew was able to survive on the most rudimentary level, no matter how well they quote played the game or done, the, you know, what they were told, went to college, did all the things that they we were promised would give us, you know, a stable life. These weren't people looking for luxury. They just wanted to be able to pay their bills. And I'm watching the same thing happen now. And it is so distressing. You know, all this talk about Bidenomics and the superpower of it and how the economy is going great. And like, you don't understand why people are upset when they can't afford groceries, when rent's gone through the roof, when housing prices have gone through the roof. Like, it's very simple. Like, people might have more money, but things cost much, much more than the money that they're making and they can't afford it and therefore they're mad. Like it, it is extremely uncomplicated and how much that's Biden's fault is up for debate. But you have to at least express some empathy and understanding and say, okay, that is indeed a problem. Here's what we're gonna do about it. And they seem incapable uh, of offering even that. This is election day today uh, in many places. And you know, the, the last poll that came out uh, New York Times and I don't know what some university showed that in five of the six uh, key states that Trump is actually ahead of Biden. And uh, then when you break it down, much of the old uh, Texiera, John Judas uh, so-called coalition of, uh, of marginal peoples, people of color, et cetera, et cetera, is now swinging towards, towards Trump. I mean, Trump's getting a much bigger chunk of those, those groups. And that, that prediction they made about minorities going to carry the Democratic Party forward is clearly failing. They've even turned on that themselves. What do you make of politics at the moment? What do you make, Sarah, right now? How do you see things right now in our two-party uh, I mean, I, I think it's disastrous. You know, I read that 70% of Americans do not want either Biden or Trump to be running. And that's accurate to me in terms of everything that I experienced, that people want neither of them. They see it as a choice between two evils. I think what's happened recently with 
Biden um, is that a lot of people were willing to suck it up and vote for him again in order to block out Trump. I mean, that's the other thing is most people are motivated more by hatred of the opponent than by the person that they're voting for. And that's true for the people voting for Trump and true for the people voting for Biden. I think Biden's uh, countenance of the slaughter of 10,000 Palestinian civilians has caused an enormous problem. And they, they seem surprised by this somehow. You know, the mm -hmm. Arab American support would drop, the Black American support would drop, any group that's experienced colonization or, or brutality from the state, of course, is going to, you know, recognize the plight of the Palestinian people. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and so yes, the support has dropped, but it was dropping before that. And it had to do, I mean, this is the irony of it. People were upset with Biden because Biden continued the policies of Trump. You know, Biden was building Trump's wall. Biden denied that COVID was still a problem. Biden started charging tons of money, you know, for COVID care and blocking statistics and, you know, just behaving in a very Trumpian manner while also not holding Trump accountable. You know, people went to the polls in droves in 2020 in the hopes that this criminality in our institutions would get gutted out. And that included Trump and his administration and what they did, but it also included the predecessors. It included the conditions that got us to the point where a man like Trump could even inhabit office. And that's why you, we had all these discussions about corruption, about systemic racism, about classism, about all these difficult topics. People finally seemed willing to engage with it about climate change, you know, and, and instead we have Biden drilling in Alaska. So it's pretty simple. It's like Biden ran on a platform full of promises, and then he broke those promises and did a lot of the same stuff Trump did that people hated and then protected the Trump people that, again, people hated. And so I don't see a sort of groundswell support for Trump. I think most people also hate Trump, often quite deeply. It's more um, a deep frustration with either of them. And I think the third party candidate you know, is doing well, you know, Robert Kennedy Jr., who I have my own problems with, uh, he's doing quite well. I think others might do quite well, but people just can't take it anymore. They're just like, neither of them, none of the above. Like, that is that is who people want. It's just nobody. And that's what's bringing us together as a country, unfortunately, is it, discussed um, with our political leadership. Yeah, I, you know, I will wrap things up here in just a bit. But one of the things that I like so much about your book is that you talked about the Spanish epidemic, 1917, my mother, 18, yeah. 18, my mother was, went through that in, in, in uh, Oklahoma and how after that, there was just, people just, you know, didn't talk about it much. They didn't process it. They just, they, and you had a, a chapter in your book called the uh, normalcy bias, which is the, you know, the cognitive bias that leads people to underestimate how bad things will get. They, yeah. they minimize it. They, and I, I like the way you kind of are showing parallels with that. We've gone through this horrible pandemic. We've gone through this horrible political um, politician that really harmed, harmed our institutions. And yet I, I uh, people aren't, freaked out about it they just it's just i don't know am i am i capturing your thoughts there no i mean i think you got it it goes back to what we were saying in the, the beginning of this conversation about this fear you know of being labeled as a conspiracy theorist or an alarmist or hysterical just for pointing out basic prevent prevalent injustices that we are all facing as a nation. And I, you know, I think COVID is one of them. Like contrary to what Joe Biden said, the pandemic is not over. You know, people are still getting sick. They're dying. They're developing long COVID. People don't fully understand the repercussions of, of long COVID. It's hard to get treatment. You know, we have a crisis in our health in our healthcare system. And, you know, the parallel that scares me most with uh, 1918 and that pandemic is that the aftermath of that pandemic is also things that we're seeing now, you know, white mob violence, anti-immigration sentiment, anti-Semitism, rising fascism, you know, all of those things I think came out in part because of the frustration and trauma of, of you know, seeing mass death and, and being cooped up inside. Um, combined with rapid technological change in the 1920s, which we're also experiencing now. And, you know, the result of that was rising fascism and then World War II. And we really seem to be on the same trajectory and don't seem to have, um, you know, or at least folks in power, don't seem to have learned very much uh, from this terrible history at all. Either that or they're eager to repeat it, uh, you know, which chills me even more. Right. The parallels are indeed right there. We did had uh, Hallstrom on with America Midnight that talked about that period of 1920 to 
the twenties. And you're, you're right. It was horrible, horrible for black people, horrible for, uh, anybody different. Um, so anyway, well, what are you working on now, Sarah, other than your podcast? I need to, if people don't subscribe to your podcast, I'll actually, I left the podcast. Oh, you did. (laughs) I I quit, um, about a, you haven't been ago. on you haven't been on recently well i took a break because uh of a family crisis um and then you know decided to focus then during that break i was also writing a book and decided to focus more on writing so i actually have a sub stack now which people oh, can go to it sarah kenzier sub stack it's new it's only been around for about two and a half weeks so i'm not surprised you don't know this i, I think that i wish that that's the nation the remainder of it would emphasize more that i'm actually on it because i think that folks think i'm still on break um but yeah i'm no longer part of of that i I was doing that for five years uh i wrote a book um it's called the last american road trip it should come out in early 2025 i think they wanted to move until after the election it's a little bit of a departure from things i've written and that's not quite as dark and hit you in the head with a sledgehammer it's like a travelogue slash history uh you know there's elements of that in my other books but of course because i wrote it like among the places i traveled to was you know being arkansas to see where iran contra happened so you know it's fun fun for the family uh, and that'll come out then and, and so that's uh what i've been working on so you mentioned that in in they knew of taking road trips with your kids and going to mm-hmm. northern arkansas to the baker hotel and and um you know the the bridge and uh, what is it? The Rock Bridge and uh, across the Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. the Shane Rocks Bridge. Yeah, you know, it's very that, much in the vein of that. The new book. That's is kind fun. Of in the that's trip. fun. Yeah, it's a way to make it palatable. I mean, it does. You know, of course, it's dark because I talk about things that have happened recently, which are all quite horrifying, and that's all in there. So it's not like some sugar coating thing. But um, you know, basically, I want to write a book about like what are we fighting for. What are the things we're afraid to lose? What are the things we value and love in our country? You know, why do I still want to be here? Like here in Missouri, here in St. Louis, here in America, like I don't want to live anywhere else. You know, I don't want to move. You know, I just want things to get better. And so that book was, um, you know, written out of love, out of frustration, um, but also out of love. And I think people will we'll see how they react. Good. Well, I'm glad you're on Substack. We had Freddie DeBoer on with twice. The first time he was just struggling and barely making it a little apartment in uh, Brooklyn and then his substack has you know I don't know 40,000 was it was it 40,000 paid 60, subscribers 62,000 62,000 oh 62,000 yeah so all of a sudden we're not feeling sorry for him for being a, <laughs> you know poor he's making doing well I hope you as well too I'll subscribe to it so oh thanks yeah, yeah. Good, good Sarah thank you so much this is this this now this is a fun Tuesday you know you read a book <laughs> Greg and I argue back and forth regarding your book, and then we get you on, and it's just a. This is pretty darn cool to. Um, yeah, well, thank you. It was fun you know, for me too. As fun as felt- talking about these terrific topics can be. <laughs> <laughs> so, and let's just. Uh, I well, I don't know about Trump and all of that. I, how did you not get sued with the? Uh, your second book i mean you oh, this were... thing got lawyered to death oh, lawyered man. to death my god you... did they go through it and i had to fight them and choose my battles and it was a real pain in the ass and that's one of the reasons i wrote a road trip book <laughs> like i'm not dealing with these <laughs> goddamn lawyers again but yeah i mean one thing ah, you folks wait. can point to if they doubt my um you know my statements in that book is they were lawyered to death no one has sued me everything is for now everything is sourced and you know double checked three billion times so it is it is all unfortunately true at and that is why I like your book. You don't you not only have index, you have extensive, extensive notes. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, hey, re- like uh, Heather Cox Richardson's uh, substack. At the end of it, a third of it is just all of her sources and where she got the information from. Yeah, so. Academic hangover. <laughs> Sometimes it can do good. but Good. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is a lot of fun. Been great. Been great. Right, thank you. Thank you both. Super. Thanks. All right. Hey.